So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Berkeley Center for New Media's Arts, Technology, and Culture Colloquium. My name is Tom McEnany, and I'm an associate professor in the departments of Comparative Literature and Spanish and Portuguese here at UC Berkeley, as well as an executive committee member of the Berkeley Center for New Media, which we call BCNM. BCNM. <laughs> Um, BCNM is an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. Through critical thinking and making, we cultivate technological fairness and equity in our classrooms, in our communities, and on the internet. Our Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium, which was founded by Ken Goldberg in 1997, is an internationally respected forum for creative ideas. It's free and open to the public, and it presents leading artists, writers, and critical thinkers who question assumptions and push boundaries at the forefront of multiple intersecting fields. Uh, BCNM is committed in particular to promoting technological equity and justice, and as such, our free events are inclusive, respectful, and harassment-free spaces. So we do not tolerate hate speech or Zoom bombing, and attendees who violate any of the community guidelines will be removed from the event and may be disallowed from future online events. Before joining our events, please read our community agreements. And uh, we can't, we're not gonna share a link to those in the chat this evening, but you can find them on the BCNM homepage under the about section. And we encourage attendees to explore native-land.ca, uh, our home on native land, to learn about the native stewards of the land that you're joining us from. And our first value tonight is to honor that land. We recognize in particular that BCNM is located in the territory of Hushin, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chochenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, specifically the confederated villages of Lishan. And the history of prolific technological development in this region has always depended on this land and all of our technological infrastructures and activities taking place, take place on and in relation to this land. So we commit to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity and relationships with tribal leaders and organizations. And I'll just say a few things about that. In particular, BCNM has, uh, under the, the, the stewardship of our current director, uh, Gail DeKosnick, led an initiative focused on uh, indigenous technologies and has held a number of events related to that topic. And if you, um, especially if you're a, a land, if you if you own property in uh, in the Bay Area, you might look into uh, the Segorte Land Trust and thinking about giving uh, giving back some some at least finances and so even some land to uh, to the Ohlone peoples. Finally, I want to also thank uh, Denise Redfield for taking care of the closed captioning this evening, and to Lara Wolf and Sophia Hussein for their indispensable infrastructural support to make this event happen. Okay, so tonight we are especially pleased to host Lawrence Abu Hamdan, 
with generous co-sponsorship from the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Arts Research Center, and the Department of Art Practice. Uh, Lawrence Abu Hamdan is a private ear. His interest with sound and its intersection with politics originate from his background as a touring musician and a facilitator of DIY music. The artist's audio investigations have been used as evidence at the UK Asylum and Immigration Tribunal and as advocacy for organizations such as Amnesty International and Defense for Children International, together with fellow researchers from forensic architecture. Abu Hamdan completed his PhD in 2017 from Goldsmiths College, University of London, and is currently a fellow at the Gray Center for Arts and Inquiry at the University of Chicago. He has exhibited his work at the 58th uh, Venice Biennale, the 11th Guangzhou Biennale, and the 13th and 14th Sharjah Biennale. Uh, the Witte de Witt the, in Rotterdam, the Tate Modern Tanks, the Chisenhalle Gallery, the Hammer Museum in LA, the Porticus in Frankfurt, the Showroom, London and Casco and Utrecht. His works are part of collections of MoMA, Guggenheim, Van Abba Museum, the Centre Pompidou and the Tate Modern. Abu Hamdan's work has been awarded the 2019 Edvard Munch Art Award, the 2016, 2016 Namjung Paik Award for New Media and in 2017, his film Rubber Coated Steel won the Tiger Short Film Award at the Rotterdam International Film Festival. For the 2019 Turner Prize, Abu Hamdan, together with nominated artists Helen Kamak, Oscar Murillo, and Tai Shani, formed a, a temporary collective in order to be jointly granted the award. And I first uh, encountered his work, uh, I think five or six years ago, uh, first on a radio program, then I had a chance to see the work displayed at the, uh, at the Hammer Museum. And it's an extraordinary pleasure to be able to welcome him tonight. I'm really looking forward to his presentation and our conversation. If you'd like to contribute to that conversation, please be sure to put your, your questions in the Q&A button that you'll see uh, linked in the bottom of your screen. So uh, welcome, Lawrence, take it away. Thank you very much. I would just set this up. Oops. My great uncle Farhan was known for stealing the stories of others. He was so shameless about it that when he published his autobiography, he self-published his autobiography, all the villagers were shocked to read that he had appropriated their late uncle's war tales, that he had pilfered their dead father's adventures as a student living in Europe, or that he stole their long past grandfather's business acumen from Saudi Arabia. The strange thing is that Farhan was not a famous man not famous to write uh, an autobiography. There was no audience for his book outside the village, and yet everyone in the village who read the book knew that those stories did not, in fact, belong to Farhan. Perhaps this is why there was an unusual and disrespectful level of noisiness and chatter at his funeral. No one put their phones on silent, and many would turn in their chairs and shout across the room to friends many rows back. Throughout all this clamor, the family stood facing the attendees like a wall of silence. They received the guests one by one with a stern solemnity before watching them disappear into a cloud of unbefitting chatter. My uncle and I sat amongst the ringtones and loud salutations, muttering to one another in a hushed tone, too closely related to the deceased to partake in the cacophony. Despite the disarray, somehow a sign that the open casket was ready to enter the room networked its way through the crowd like ice freezing everything in its path. Ironically, it was me and my with a conscientious whisper that were among the last to become aware of the sudden change in the room's acoustic temperature. We had barely noticed that the room had fallen silent until our voices, once the most hushed in the room, were suddenly amplified to the loudest. One thousand, uh, sorry, um, I turned my head away from my uncle to face the silence, and at that moment my ears were suddenly met with a dreadful sound. One thousand white plastic chairs scraping the tiles as they were picked up 
dragged and stacked on top of one another in rows that line the four walls of this vast multi-use municipal hall. This clearing of the chairs was to make way for the casket and to assure the attendees stood in respect of the dead. Its physical amplitude was vast, but what made it more punishing was its object quality. Its coarse, low, granular groan was accompanied by a whistle scrape that seared up beyond the frequency spectrum of what is humanly audible. The eruption was fleeting. While we were in the lingering cloud of its reverberations, the attendees had fallen back to the silence that preceded it. Though I did see the corpse that day, I can no longer really recall how he looked, what he was wearing, how his face was exhibited, and yet the sound that preceded his image is still etched into my cortex. In 1968, Alistair Cook, the BBC correspondent to the US, was one of the many witnesses to the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. His account included an unusual detail. He said that there was suddenly a banging repetition of a sound that I do not know how to describe. Not at all like shots, but like somebody dropping a rack of trays. Even after the fact of him knowing what he had in fact heard was gunshots, he still retained the sonic image of the rack of trays as a central part of his testimony uh, and a repeated part of his testimony. Even after he saw Bobby Kennedy lying on the ground, felled, he continued to negate the sound of the gunshots and speak only of the tray rack. It was as if the rack of trays was a kind of buffer to reality, the last thing standing between what actually happened and an imaginary realm of alternate scenarios where what never happened, what, what, what happened never happened. I've since come across many similar examples where benign objects stand in the place of the facts of the event itself. It didn't sound like a punch, but a lighter being thrown to the ground and popping, said a witness in an Oregon courthouse. A New Zealand witness said of a blow he overheard, it sounded like an egg cracking. Sometimes, as in the case of the egg, the objects are repeated during the testimony with such frequency that it becomes seemingly impossible for the witness to uncouple the sound of the egg, indeed the apparition of the egg itself, from the violent event they have witnessed. It's not so much the information about the event, and the, but the process of encoding and recalling such events that becomes stored in these objects. The egg the 1,000 white plastic chairs do not capture the event itself, but they petrify the moment of the event's mental processing. These objects allow us to remain with the event at the moment it first entered the mind's ear of its witness. These object images become a relic of the split second between the event and its reckoning. This split second can endure for years and years before the event is reconciled for what it in fact was. There was an eight-year gap, for example, until the translators of the Nuremberg trials finally began to speak and write about what they had heard and translated. One gets so attached to the wording that one does not notice the content, said Henry Lee, Nuremberg translator. It says, only years later one awakes, one awakes gradually and realizes the content that has been registered somewhere subconsciously. This meant that the monstrosities of the Nazi war criminals that were, late, that were translated by the Nuremberg interpreters became conscious in and of themselves only with a delay of time. This lapse in time was perhaps due to the fact that a partial elimination of their consciousness was required to make the task of simultaneous translation possible. They had to listen to other people's voices while they are speaking themselves, and to do this they have to become somewhat machinic. Interpreters have to react to words with interpretation, uh, with interpretation at reflex-like speeds. Simultaneous translators did have one instrument to slow and pause the speed of sound that flowed into their headphones. A yellow and a red bulb built into the witness stand and the prosecutor's podium. The interpreter in a room adjacent to the courtroom could control these lights, flashing the yellow light once signaled the order to speak slower, while three quick pulses demanded the speaker raise their voice. One red flash indicated that a sentence needed to be repeated, that an utterance was incomprehensible or untranslatable. In this mass media event, these lights exposed the moments in which witnesses became unintelligible. The flare of the red light emblazoned their faces at the moment they struggled the most to make what they had seen speakable. The translators were used as a technology to facilitate across Russian, English, German, and French, but they were not themselves part of the historical record. We have no recordings of the voices of Nuremberg translators in the act of translation. We only have them staged 
as a kind of newsreel, um, recordings of them in the act of, in the actual act process of them translating do not exist. The only record of their presence in the trial, as the trial is going on, is the red and yellow light bulb silently flashing in the film footage. In fact, they're not really silent, they make a little tuck, like explosion when they come on. When we cross-reference the moments where we see these flashes with the trial transcript, we quickly notice that these illuminate interruptions have been mostly deleted. In here, the system being discussed on the original recordings in the trial. Uh, in the transcript, there's no record of such moments as when the flashing red light, the order to repeat, totally derails a witness's train of thought, or how a judge steps in to decode the meaning of flashing yellow lights that dumbfound a witness on the stand. In the transcript of the trial, the relay from voice to voice appears as a smooth and seamless passage. This was the task of the stenographer. This is the task of the stenographer to free testimony from its very sounding, to clean it from its shuddering issuance, to render historically inaudible the inner contest between the intention of an utterance and the act of its uttering. I once met a court stenographer in London. He described to me that in order to transcribe at the speed of speech, one has to enter the state termed autopilot mode. To access this plane of consciousness, trial stenographers find a single architectural ornament or, uh, or any kind of detail in the room. Perhaps it's the top right corner of the window cornice or the beveling of an architrave or the point where the crown molding meets the ceiling. While their eyes scan every centimeter of this object, a pre-conscious channel opens between their ears and their fingertips. This not only allows them to type at the necessary speed, but also creates a kind of acoustic force field to protect them from the otherwise heavy labor of having to spend days and days listening to content which can often pertain to violence and fatality. Courtroom stenographers are becoming increasingly rare in criminal trials in the US, Australia and the UK. This is not because their labor is becoming automated, but rather outsourced. More and more criminal trials are being audio recorded and these recordings are being sent for transcription to a collection of companies based in the city of Ahmedabad in India. A perfect combination of reduced labor costs, time difference, and a shared common law legal system enforced on India during British colonial rule make India the ideal candidate to transcribe the trials of their former colonizers and their former colonizers' former colonies. What saves them more money in this context is that no special training is required for the stenographer. They are not transcribing in real time. These typists do not need to know how to enter the stenographic K-hole that allows them to type at the speed of sound. They can simply pause and rewind the recording to make sure each word is recorded in the transcript as it was spoken. This means the transcribers in Ahmedabad personally retain more of the content of what is being spoken in trials. The pause button creates a portal, an opening through which a cacophony of malign voices directly flow into comprehension. The pause and rewind button inaugurate new conditions of labor for the transcriber. Although they are geographically much further away from the voices of the courtroom, they are somehow much closer to the testimonies than the stenographer who sits just meters away from them at the witness stand. There's also a pause and rewind button slow the overall labor. They accelerate the time it takes for the information to become envisaged. The Gujarati transcribers must work harder to create their acoustic force field, their architectural ornament, their eight year lapse of subconscious processing, their rack of trays, their thousand white plastic chairs, anything to soften the collision between a sound and the image it conjures. That's a kind of uh, prelude to this lecture today called the sonic image. I would really like to thank uh, Sophia Sen, Lara and Tom McEn McEnany, Lara Wolf and Tom McEnany for the invitation. Um, and with that kind of prelude hanging over us, I wanted to attempt to get closer into the kind of second half of this talk or this or the main part um, to the argument of uh, uh, to, 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 this, to, to this concept and the argument of the sonic image. So it's kind of sitting there unresolved over our heads through these examples. And I want to say also um, that for reasons that will, should become obvious towards the end of this, um, it's really important that each 
small sound vibrates with another potentially unexpected sound that we follow its trajectory um, and that you could follow it with me across many geographies and times. With that said, I will continue. Through the walls of Boris Johnson's London apartment leaked out the sounds of a domestic altercation between his, with his partner Carrie Simmons. In a statement given to the police, his neighbor and witness to the incident said, it became clear to me that the shouting was coming from a neighbor's flat. It was loud enough and angry enough that I felt frightened and concerned for the welfare of those involved. After a loud scream and banging followed by silence, I ran upstairs and with my wife agreed that we should check on our neighbors. Johnson's defenders um, uh, in the press, uh, mostly employees of Rupert, Rupert Murdoch, accused this witness of being a curtain twitcher. It's a quote. The curtain twitcher is a slur specifically reserved for an eyewitness, one who intentionally peers and directs their gaze at an incident out of unwarranted curiosity. The witness in this case, however, was not an eyewitness, but an ear witness, as clearly is mentioned in the um, uh, in his statement, he never saw anything. It's all descriptions of sounds moving through walls. Rather than violating the privacy of another, uh, um, the witness, yeah. So rather than violating the privacy of another, the ear witness in this case has his own private space invaded by the acoustic incidents of the neighbors. So in terms of acoustic space, the moment of the a shared space. They are in one space together, despite the division of rooms that separate the space visually. In turning this testimony from ear to eye, the press falsely ass assign intention and equi equally a debasement of the evidentiary value of the testimony. Um, so this is an actual uh, image of, uh, of, of this sound moving through a wall. In fact, this is the sort of, this is the sound in all of its, um, if you're in the same room as it, with all of its loudness. And this is actually the remnant of the sound that passed through the wall. So you see, actually, it's mostly the, the low frequencies that really pass through. Some of the highs also do. So this is kind of like um, an image that will sit there. And though this is an image of sound, this is not a sonic image. And I will explain why, I hope, as we talk through. So I wanted to kind of start with this kind of red herring of a visualization of a sound that is not a sonic image. Um, so, this, so, so this story of uh, the press turning the uh, ear witness into an eyewitness um, for their own political gains is just one example of a display of kind of vested interest in erroneously applying the visual logic, visual space onto the sonic. There's many throughout my years where I've, uh, I've seen sound treated as a, as a poor image. Uh, especially in the realm of evidence, um, despite the fact of its huge prevalence as a source of evidence, right? Because if any event happens, you're more, much more likely to hear it than to be, be within of its eye shot. You're much more likely to be in its ear shot than within, within its eye shot. And eye shot doesn't exist as a word, I know. So, um, so, so, so almost many, many trials hinge on ear witness testimony, and yet that it's always kind of treated um, in the same terms as I testimony, but uh, sort of a poor version or something like that. There's no specifics to how it's treated. But what I, so, so what I want to talk about today is that rather than the, this configuration of sound to image, what is at stake in the inverse that is using the sonic imagination to trouble the image? Rather than sounds being forced to behave in the logic of the image, how can an image behave like a sound? What is politically at stake in making and seeing images that leak through and beyond the sensory and spatial frame, even temporal frame? It's not often that I'm asked to speak about images. Uh, no, but... Uh, da, da, da. So, um, I, will, I will show actually two pro projects of mine now, which I think somehow propose uh, uh, an answer to myself. What is at stake in making images, making and seeing images that leak through and beyond their sensory and spatial frame? 
So I'm going to put, I'm going to start with a work from 2012, and then I'm going to speak about work I'm developing now. And I want to put them together because in both cases we see how the sonic image become necessary to establish new ways by which claims can be made and formally silence testimony heard. So in the year 2000, there was a total of 15 fortified border walls and fences between sovereign nations. Today, physical barriers at 63 borders defied nations across four continents. This huge increase in the fortification of borders over the last 17 years uh, has not only consisted of razor wire and concrete, but also a huge increase in so-called immaterial and biometric strategies, including the forensic analysis of migrants' voices. Immigration authorities around the world turned to forensic speech analysis to determine if the accent of asylum seekers correlated with their claim of national origins. In order to see where people are originated from, areas in order to see if people originated from areas perceived to be dangerous enough for them to legitimately claim asylum. Borders were thus instituted and constructed within of the voice itself. This process, called language analysis for the determination of origin, or LADO, was first implemented in 2003. And LADO uses its capacities to supposedly derive the truth of an utterance to help determine the validity of asylum claims made by tens of thousands of people without identity documents coming to Australia, Belgium, Germany, Netherlands, New Zealand, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. In fact, for once, the US is off this kind of list of evil white countries. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it's probably because the, um, the distance that people would have to travel for the US to have a, such a heterogeneous set of accents and claims. I don't know, potentially, but the US doesn't do this. LADO is most, mostly conducted by one of two private companies run by forensic phoneticians based in Sweden, Sprakab and Verified. LADO reports are achieved by soliciting the speech of the claimant via a telephone interview organized uh, between the former asylum seeker and an anonymous listener, hired by one of the two aforementioned companies. These listeners are former refugees, now Swedish citizens that originate from the countries or neighboring countries of those who are claiming asylum. These people are tasked with making a series of assertions about where they believe the asylum seeker really comes from. These unscientific assumptions are reworked into reports by linguists to bolster the claims of the anonymized former refugee analysts with international phonetic symbols and a or expert report to use in the asylum tribunals uh, all over the countries that I was speaking about before. So I actually in, uh, worked with um, nine, uh, well, actually 11 uh, Somali um, asylum seekers who had already become um, very well uh, politically uh, uh, mobilized in the Netherlands. This was in 2011, 2012. They'd held sit-ins in the detention centers. They were doing a lot of work um, and, and uh, activism around their situation and the situation of others like them. Um, and we got together um, to try to think of ways which we could contest this accent analysis, in which they'd all been through and all experienced. Um, uh, and uh, so we thought, well, we needed to, to contest the government maps that were being produced uh, with our own maps. Um, and the government maps were essentially, uh, and, and then, the, then we could present our own maps as a kind of counter testimony, right? Because so uh, what, what would happen, let's say, is that um, uh, if, if a court would be given a map of Somalia with three lines drawn through it, for example, right? It would say northern accent, coastal accent, and um, um, southern accent. And um, so, so this would be a, a map with two, three, two lines drawn on it, right? So essentially really underscoring uh, the ways in which the law imagines, uh, does not, lacks a sonic imagination, right? Really to understand that the voice does not cross thresholds, right? Uh, that sound does not leak, but it really remains stable in these three ways and uh, scoring lines as, as has been done throughout the history of colonialism is just um, a continuation of that same act of violence. 
So the government has this map of Somalia. It says, okay, these are three accents that exist there. Um, and so this is really directly trying to respond to that and trying to produce a kind of counter, a series of counter maps that would be hopefully uh, uh, um, uh, show not only uh, an argument against the use of this language analysis for the determination of origin, but also um, stand as a proposal uh, against the forms of, by which evidence is solicited um, uh, through a kind of visual logic. So an accent, of course, should not be understood as the pronouncement of a place of origin, but rather as equivalent to layers of metadata. An accent is an indication of the voice as a network, a network with nodes in various places, times, and identities. An accent is formed through and in communication with others. In this sense, we hear not only the speaking subject, but traces of their past and present interlocutors. The voice has a tendency to mimic the accent the sound of an accent is possessed to some degree by every person it has ever come into, in, come into contact with. When the accent is heard as a network rather than a birth certificate, we hear it as a biography of migration, as an irregular and itinerant concoction of contagiously accumulated voices, rather than as an immediately distinguishable sound that avows its defined roots within the confines of a nation state, or even uh, internally within the nation state. So don't forget, with these lines that they're drawing, or with these accents, they're actually instituting borders that, that do not de facto exist. Uh, sorry, do not de jure exist. They do not exist in law, but they exist within of the sort of logics of the asylum system. So actually, it's not even that there are borders of nations being policed. There are internally um, more and more borders, which of course include ones instituting within the voices of migrants, but also internally within the countries in which they originate. Right. So um, such irregularities should in fact provide proof of an applicant's need for asylum stability, right? So often what they would deny, they would deny people uh, on the basis of irregular pronouncing. Uh, so they would say, okay, well, he used this word or this accent or this lexical variety from the South uh, and therefore uh, we cannot, uh, we do not believe that they're from uh, coastal region uh, Mogadishu. So if they could prove they're from the north, for example, that would be a, a considered a safe zone, even though there was no po possibility to return to the north um, from the Netherlands, it would be considered a safe zone um, and therefore it would deny their right to asylum. What that means is, of course, probably very similar to you have in the US, it's not, it's just a figure that is then shared, right? That this government deported this many people, right? What that means, they issued deportation hearings uh, or they issued a deportation, but those people remain, of course, in those countries. They, ha they have no, they don't actually try to help them back or get, get uh, or, 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 or take them there. Of course, the government cannot take them back to the north of Somalia, which they claim is a safe zone. That would be in violation of, of uh, international law. So, um, so these people just sit in limbo with a with a deportation order, um, and uh, so yeah, uh, so so this this accent analysis was a kind of engine for producing um, uh, for just rejection and producing a lot of people um, uh, to enter a kind of limbo like state within of the countries or not even limbo I mean just a sort of terminal state of precarity. Um, so um, so yes yeah, so. The, app, the, 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 the person, uh, if they had a very stable voice, right, they would be, um, uh, you know, defined as one place in migration, right? So often what would happen is that um, they would find a lot of people from the north, right, which was this sort of safe zone. Why? Because they would find uh, some words taken from the north. But this is kind of totally, uh, you know, which I will show, doesn't really re reflect the history of Somalia. Also, the fact that many people were living in uh, Kenya uh, in refugee camps uh, before they came. So it's just sort of like doesn't uh, touch any kind of ma uh, material reality of the ways in which people move. It just thinks of the voice as a as a bureaucratic document that contains only uh, a kind of register of where that person was born. So um, 
Ladder promotes a system of vocal governance that deems speakers with multiple and mixed accents as dishonest. Yet in the governance of accents, the border is a visual demarcation that dissects a sonic plane. And in these images, I'm trying to specifically invert that to show that sounds cannot so easily be dissected by the colonizers, cartographic rulers and pens. So it is through the sonic image that I will show you now that I propose strategies for mapping the voice, which are more faithful to the way that the medium bleed through histories, bodies and borders. The attempt here is not only to render an image of sound, but rather to create an image that itself behaves like sound. So um, this, is the, this is the two maps that I will show, our kind of counter maps. This was presented in, uh, uh, to the head of uh, uh, um, immigration, uh, the, one of the chief judges in the uh, Netherlands. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, this was 2012. So, here, what we did was uh, basically these are um, historical events that all the people that we met have lived through, or like you know, simply affected their their the biography uh, uh, from where they lived in their lives, multiple places. Uh, these are the three accents that the government use. So here, northern coastal Somalia. That's what they determine, right? And we give each one of the and these are the um, uh, historical events I was speaking about. Um, so we give each of these um, uh, northern, coastal, and southern a different quality of line. Um, and here you see them move, these, these little cells start to move through these historical events. As they pass through them, they start to, of course, mix and integrate and form you know, as, as, new, as new migrations you know, are forced through these um, historical events, right, um, up and down the country. The last, that's what we're trying to show, that in the last 40 years of Somalia, people have been just moving up and down internally out of the country uh, only. So as we move through these different uh, territories from coastal here to northern, the accents start to gain in complexity here from a northern migration to the southern part, here a southern migration to, again, back to the north, right, this is all within the 40 years. Um, and then at the end, you see kind of like new types of line are born, right? New kinds of quality that uh, become unrecognizable. And actually what happens is that you, you, if you move through those uh, uh, ways of mapping the voice, you'll see actually every possibility of, of uh, vocal irregularity exists. And then there was the personal um, maps we made. Um, so these are the words that the person was rejected based on. Um, this is their uh, uh, rejection letter. This is a counter letter where we we got we hired a language studio to to uh, give an, uh, actually a totally different result. Uh, not language studio like a, another forensic analysis counter forensic analysis. Um, here is the person in the center. Imagine that's the person in the center. Uh, these are all the kind of languages and dialects they speak in the, in a kind of regular basis. Or, or is around them. Um, uh, so there you go. Uh, that's that. These are linked like that. So you see this person is now in dialogue with this person, right? <laughs> in a way, they're linked. Um, and that has this kind of quality of line. Um, as you see here, those are the languages that are each given a kind of quality of line. And as of course you move closer, it just becomes this, this mess of who we in fact are, right? Um, and that's what I wanted to say, that it's an attempt to not only render an image of a sound, but rather to create an image that behaves like sound. Think about ways in which we can, we can show kind of bleed between uh, time, um, uh, uh, space, national frontiers, and stuff like that. So. This is um, this is an early attempt at a kind of sonic image, um, and I will move through the next example. Um, the next example is in fact nothing to do with sound, and that's why I think it's important to sort of expand this concept beyond uh, the discussion on sound and specifics of sound um, to, to in fact something else. Um, I want to see if the idea of the sonic image can itself leak past its own disciplinary boundaries to form a generalized relation of the image to the image that is not specifically dedicated to capturing sounds leaking through borders or walls, but in this case, if it can be used to make visible 
distinct ways in which memories leak through time and subjectivities. So, when were you born? March uh, 27, 1987. You were born in 1987, and when did uh, Yusuf al-Jawhari die, you in your previous life? February 26, 1984. So when was you, as Yusuf al-Jawhari, born? 1967. So this is my latest uh, work from 2019. It's a film called Once Removed. Um, and this interview, it's an interview film. You can see it, it's on YouTube. Um, uh, in fact, all the films are on YouTube that I've made. Um, it's a film um, that has really, this, it's an interview that has really changed a lot, changed my brain. <laughs> and, um, and since then, it's something I'm really like working through, working on, uh, uh, and, um, and so, so I wanted to sort of take this earlier project and then see where these intersections are when we, we take it out of the out of Sonic because this interview is with a guy called Baslam Shaheen. He's my cousin's cousin, um, or it's not even as easy as that, but we can just say cousin. Um, he is roughly my age, but he is also the reincarnation of Yusuf al-Jawhari, a child soldier who died at 16 during the 1984 Shufar in Hamdun. And I'm actually going to be speaking only about this project and everything um, that it encompasses in uh, the rhetoric department in Berkeley, uh, I think, uh, next month. So if you're interested, I think it's, uh, I will find the date. but. I'm just going to be speaking about uh, this work, but for now, it's an engine to think through this concept of the sonic image. Um, Bass's reincarnation is not unusual in that he is born to a religious community who believe in reincarnation. The same community made up of the majority of the militia of the Progressive Socialist Party for which Bass had fought in his past life. Uh, in the context of this presentation on the politics of the sonic image, I will be unfolding but one strand of, of the many in Bass's story. And like I said, there, the many will be unfolded in another event. One that particularly refers to Bass's search for his own image. So this is about how he tried to look for his own image. Bass's flashback to a time he did not himself live have compelled Bassel to become an autodidact historian. A young man pushed to find traces of his own existence used his reincarnation to amass not only information about his own life, but the largest archive of photography, weaponry, uniform, flags, and badges of the Shufor and the entire militia of the Progressive Socialist Party. Vassil began by collecting posters from that period, hoping to find a correct record of his own death and an image of who he used to be. With one of the militia's key graphic designers, the poster and poster printers, the now elderly designer gave Basil free reign amongst his disordered remnants. Amongst all defective prints, flags, and never realized designs, he eventually found one in which Yusuf's name appeared. The space where his image would normally appear was blank. Basil left the designer's house not only with this poster, but with many of the half discarded posters and flags and badges he could carry. Basil still sought to procure his own image, and up to that point, he had not gone to his parents from his past life. Inevitably, one day, Basa knocked on the door of the Jahri family home, Hamdun. His former sister opened. Basa announced who he was and who he had been and was quickly welcomed inside. Uh, he was welcomed by Fuad Jahri, Yusuf's father, um, who gave him the uniforms uh, that Yusuf wore during the war, uh, including the one in which he had died and the rifle he had used. And when Basil inquired if there was a photograph he could have, Fuad, his former father, explained that there was only one existing image they had of Yusuf, and it was an out-of-focus black and white image taken when he was only six years old, adding that Yusuf hated having his picture taken. Thinking that maybe his ex-comrades from the war in Alay might have a picture of Yusuf, Basil began to locate and interview whomsoever he had known. This is how he began accessing and archiving personal photographs and collecting memorabilia of many ex-fighters across Lebanon. Starting with people who had fought or trained with Yusuf, and then people who had fought and trained with those people, and then people who had fought and trained with those people, and so on and so forth. 
until he created a network of across the mountains of ex-fighters and their family members. Bas's reincarnation has given him access. His reincarnation and his research are inseparable. If an ordinary bona fide university historian were to show up at these houses asking for such documents, they would be told that none exist. But as a returned fallen comrade, Basil is treated differently. Amongst the community of those who believe in reincarnation, he is, after some explaining, welcome to see, then eventually, for the most part, archive this material. This is how Basil has now become a historical resource. He holds vital information for anyone hoping to understand the historical record of a time which has been cancelled from history by the state, with mass graves hidden, amnesty laws precluding the possibility of justice, and no sign of the war in any school textbook or curriculum. This means that Bess's unorthodox production of history through his reincarnation is not simply an alternative means for the production of history, it is one of the few viable ways for it to even emerge. And how young were you when you started fighting? as young as 14 or 15. And so do you think you could have been one of these kids here? Because this is from Ale, right? I'm not 100% sure, but you never looked at the faces in the background and tried to identify if any of them were Yusuf Johari? I try, but it's hard to tell because I don't know how I looked like. And I still look for, till today, I still look for my picture. Mm. And I can't fi manage to find any pic, although many of, my ex-friends or ex-colleagues or ex-fighters uh, who used to fight with me say, you may have pictures of you in Ale if you go up and you search in Ale. But you don't know what you look like. No, so. I don't know what I look like. So I don't know how to figure out how I look like or how am I going to identify that myself unless somebody tells me this is you. That's another story. So, um Bassa still has very little idea of what he looked like in his previous life. Um, he may have an image of Yusuf in his vast archive, but without knowing what he looked like, he cannot identify himself amongst his collection. With the idea that we could try to see if indeed such a picture exists amongst Bassa's collection, I approached Dr. Caroline Wilkinson at FaceLab, a research group at Liverpool's John Moores University. They carry out um, like archaeological facial synthesis and um, facial synthesis for missing persons uh, cases. Um, this is the uh, six-year-old uh, Yusuf Jauhari, the only existing image. And I asked her if she could use the image of Yusuf as a six-year-old child um, and reconstruct what he, as well as, uh, this is as well as reference images that we got uh, from his father and his brother, um, and reconstruct what he, he looked like at 16 years old when he passed. This was, this was the result of uh, uh, Dr. Caroline Wilkinson's work. Um, the process she used to create this image is often used in missing persons cases, particularly when someone goes missing as a child. And she explained to me that she had astonishing results that, um, you know, circulating images that she sometimes only reconstructs from a skull has led to actually ident uh, uh, identification by the public, right? So they circulate these images, people identify them, or if they knew them. Um, Dr. Wilkinson explained to me that her success in these cases depends on staying within a tight threshold of recognition. The face has to be both specific enough to elicit the memories of those who have seen the face before, while also generic enough not to overstate any one specific characteristic. This is for fear of throwing people off the trail of identifying them. You need to open and activate the interpretive capacities of the viewer. To do this, the faces have also to be somewhat digital. There must be enough digital artifacts like this, in, like intentional pixelization, um, to be able to tell that this is indeed an illustration and not a real photograph. For if it is too real, people will not be able to interpret the image At the same time, the face cannot be completely digitally rendered, as Dr. Wilkinson needs the public to see this face as real and as believably human to solicit a kind of urgency of their gaze. To keep this human threshold, she must use real human facial features. Each of the features that make up this image are actually cut and, cut, cut and copied out of anthropological archives and photographic databases. To make her database, Wilkinson collects endless portrait books including titles such as The Berbers of Africa, Faces of the Zulu, 
the Atlas of Beauty, women, in the women of the World in 500 Portraits, Crowns, Portraits of Black Women in Church Hats, The Photographer's Guide to Posing, Techniques to Flatter Everyone, The Moment It Clicks, Tibetan Portraits. She harvests from these books eyebrows, hairlines, noses, eyes, mouths, chins, facial hair, and skin textures. She then intentionally erases the sources of these images so that they become a sea of unidentified stray features floating away from the faces they were originally attached. She does this to limit her own cognitive racial bias and focus only on the distinct feature which she feels would best fit the face she is reconstructing. Uh, she also creates this massive mix so that she will not be tempted to use too many features from one single face, or she risks recreating an incident from an FBI investigation in 2011. During their search for Osama bin Laden, they released to the public an image of a synthesized, older-looking bin Laden. Um, in doing so, they used too much of the face of Spanish politician Gaspar Limazares, that's him, and many Spaniards recognized Limazares in the face of bin Laden, who became in, and he became enraged, forcing the FBI to retract the image and apologize. For Wilkinson, this became a lesson to choose each feature separately. In order to be able to compose Yusuf's face, Wilkinson must look through her unaccounted catalog of features before fixing on the faces of the eight people that constitute his one face. The eyes were chosen because at a young age they seemed already to have eyes which sat shallow in their sockets, eyes where the lids protruded. Only the lips were significantly altered in Photoshop, puffed up a little to match the development of lips in his family. The memories that are lodged in Basil's mind are, are not a product of empathy for uh, uh, people suffered by the, uh, for the suffering of a generation which preceded his. For empathy suggests otherness. It is not that he can feel another individual's pain, but that through reincarnation, individuality itself become undermined. That is why this face, made of many nameless faces, or the eight nameless faces, is somehow for me not only the perfect, it's not a, not a potentially a perfect portrait of Yusuf. In fact, we haven't been able to find anyone that looked like that. Um, it might not be a perfect portrait of Yusuf, but it perhaps is the perfect portrait of a new category of witness that reincarnated testimony produces. Witnesses who leak into other bodies, who bleed across generation and potentially sectarian divides, forcing new pathways for the production of history that have otherwise been sealed. But why is this then a sonic image? And these are, these are the closing remarks. Why is this a sonic image? Because my argument is an image behaves like a sound when its truth value is derived out of its relational rather than its individual qualities. Essentially an image which leaks. Material conditions of sound make it an inherently difficult article of evidence as it cannot be isolated from the space in which it resounds. Sound waves, unlike photons of light, of course, do not themselves move through medium, but rather cause a rippling effect that creates rapid series of movements of molecules all around them. The object of sound is not itself moving, but rather causing movement. The vibration of sound is therefore a collaboration between distinct objects. And this is why analyzing sound is a challenging to the ways in which the evidentiary fragments are conventionally managed. Sound and sonic imagination therefore act as new propositions for soliciting evidence and in turn for producing and reading images that are continuous with the omnidirectional and uncontainable way that sound propagates both through the space of a building, the border of a nation, or through the architecture of memory itself. At stake in the sonic image is then an end to isolationist practices, an end to an ideology of monolingualism, as we saw in uh, um, conflict, uh, the maps uh, of the asylum seekers, an end to an ideology, uh, ideology of monolingualism and binary forms of identitarianism. I've tried to show how, when the logic of acoustic inseparability is applied to the image, counter forms of testimony can be made audible. An image that behaves sonically can become a medium for truths to emerge that are impossible in a world in which our listening is still governed by the tightly defined boundaries of the visual image. Thank you very much. Uh, Lawrence, 
thank you, thank you, thank you so much. That's uh, incredible. My my mind is is reeling a, a bit, uh, <laughs> just trying to to process everything that we just heard and saw. Um, so just a reminder to everyone, if you want to, if you have any questions, please do put them in the in the Q&A box and we'll incorporate them into the conversation. I'm going to start off our conversation with just uh, a few questions of my own. Um, so, so one way that I'm just beginning to, to process this material uh, is through, you know, is, is through classification. And, and, so, and so thinking in part of um, one binary that's operative for me that I, that I hear going throughout the talk and that I think does kind of resound at the end, which is between trauma and evidence. And you opened with these, uh, you know, kind of images uh, or, or resonant, resonant moments of a traumatic disconnect between an event and the processing of, of that event or the understanding of that event in some ways. The scrape of the, of the chairs um, at your family member's funeral, uh, the way that uh, uh, the BBC correspondent heard the gunshots at Bobby Kennedy's assassination, etc. cetera. And um, I'm, I'm trying to, to understand uh, how different media in particular relate to this relationship between trauma and evidence. And it seems like with Nuremberg in particular, you know, with Nuremberg, you have the invention of a particular technology to enable a new mode of translation. I think the Nuremberg trials are the first time that we have simultaneous mm -hmm. translation, right? Um, and you focused, I'd never heard anything about the, the light bulbs. I'd only heard about the, the headsets. And, and so right there, we do have this incorporation, of course, of, of something that's happening uh, sonically, but also something that's, that's happening visually. And so this is more of an audiovisual processing instead of just a, a sonic one. Um, so I'm uh, working through that. I'm, I'm wondering just to, to speak about media for a moment about the different relationships uh, that you see or that you understand media caring when it comes to trauma. And in particular, you know, you, you talked about the difference, for instance, of the stenographer who is, is hearing in a particular way, um, creating this force field so that they're not paying attention to speech. They're, they're, they're just, they're machinic, they're reflexive, but they're not really paying attention to the content of speech. Um, the, the translator who's, who's doing something, something similar um, and the, the print document that erases all of those hesitation or broken moments. But what's interesting to me, so, so on the one hand, we have uh, recording media or, or, or the, the headsets and how they potentially protect someone from trauma, the typewriter, um, the transcript itself that we can read. And then finally, the outsourced labor of listeners in India who have a new relationship to that speech precisely because they have a new technology to hear. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you see the relationship between different sonic technologies and traumatic experience? Um, yes, so I suppose it's not really, I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, as much as that, that was present in the talk, I'm not so, you know, I, I, I try to, at the end, also say why I think um, trauma as a historical um, tool is not necessarily what's at stake here, right? It's not really what I'm talking about. I mean, I think you can't, I, I don't, I haven't seen successfully that applied to um, political and historic events, of course, as it is successfully applied to the study of personal trauma, right? Um, and so it's not really like, um, I'm, I'm not using trauma in that way. Um, more it's about these sort of um, moments in the processing, right? Sort of like, uh, the, sort of like breaking down um, parts of uh, the process in which an event become encoded. Um, and uh, in doing that, uh, I suppose what the, the, the key um, fields would be is 
that um, sound bleeds. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, I think, you know, there's this idea that um, uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of uh, traumatic event, of which those, many of those are not, right? Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not that all of this is trauma, 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 not at all. But let's say if we, if we follow what, what you say, um, trauma is, is defined by um, uh, a kind of certain type of ineffability, right? Uh, un, uh, turning things unspeakable, um, a loss of diagnostic capacities, right? Um, the inability to, to understand and separate, uh, uh, right? Uh, to, to parse the world in, in tidy ways. Um, and I think what I'm trying to offer as a kind of counter, let's say, historical and political theory to that, but one which shares something, is this way in which, uh, is this bleed, right? Is this idea of um, things really leaking into one another and being able to measure their veracity based on that leakage rather than on uh, their, their separability, right? Um, that the leakage is itself proof, right? As Shoshana Feldman, perhaps this is the, the, the successful use of trauma theory, right? A Shoshana Feldman show, right? That the fainting in uh, the Eichmann trial can in itself be a kind of evidentiary uh, 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 stable unit, right? Rather than something that shows kind of like that 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 that, that is kind of irrational speech before the court, or is considered kind of um, shocking but not admissible, right? So so sound um, in the history of the sound with the law, it always flirts with inadmissibility because it's a, it's a kind of dirty evidence, right? Um, I, you know, I use an image here, it could be another talk which would say almost exactly the same thing on dirty evidence, right? <laughs> dirty evidence is evidence whose truth value is derived from its very inadmissibility, right? That let's say something that is just, just can't, like Basil's testimony, right? As a reincarnated person, it cannot be entered into the production of history because it it's, it can't be entered without someone saying, oh, he believes in this. And I didn't use the word belief uh, for, for exactly that reason. Right? So it can't, be, it can't really be entered into history. It's, it's irrational into the production of, of historiography. Um, and yet it's, all, it's one of the only viable ways in which we can today produce that history. So um, uh, what was I going to say? Yes, yeah, so, so that in many ways, um, the history of sound in presented in the law court is a sort of history of dirty evidence and a way in which it's constantly it, 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 the, it, the logics of sound and the logics by which evidence is solicited are so um, different <laughs> that actually they make them uh, somewhat incomprehensible to, to one another, and yet it is presented uh, so often in a court of law. Sounds are constantly being evoked in a trial. Um, and so that's what, for me, has kept me so interested in that, right? Uh, that kind of disconnect. And it's not necessarily a, the traumatic disconnect, right? It's not necessarily a, a disconnect created by trauma, but it's a sort of, dis it's a medium disconnection, right? Um, like, I wasn't traumatized by my uncle's funeral uh, and um, perhaps connecting that to Nuremberg it, it gives that impression but it's not it, it's there's something else at stake and I think it's about these sort of these these bleeds it's about these um, moments where things start to create sort of um, uh, through time um, uh, worlds start to meet, which would not be possible within of the um, uh, way we think about and parse the world visually, right? And I often use this example from the Pistorius trial, right, where um, they tried to prove that he, it wasn't gunshots the witness heard, but it was uh, someone hitting the door with a cricket bat, right? And that he, he, it was him screaming, not her screaming. Because if it was her screaming, and I, I don't want to go into the whole thing of the case, then he would have known it was her, right? And so his whole, his whole point was that it was a, um, someone, it was an intruder. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So what they did was they got a cricket bat in court and started smacking a door with it. Um, and so, you know, this was done in the, in the idea of um, uh, a forensic reenactment, right? It was trying to say that, okay, this door, um, uh, th let's, let's hear this, right? Let's do a forensic reenactment. But of course, it wasn't forensics. It was the theory, it was, a, it was what it was, was a kind of display of uh, those, that disconnect, right? Where in which, in the world of sound, a cricket bat could be confused with a gun, right? And in the world of images, that could never happen, right? There would often, there'd probably be very few examples where those are even in the same sentence, right? In the, let's say, in the history of literature or whatever, right? In the history, of, the cricket bat and gun were probably very rarely to, ever together, right? But suddenly, the, through, through a sort of sonic act, they become sort of infused. And so worlds meet each other, which are not necessarily um, possible when we have another man. And, and that's what that guy's uh, showing, right? So he's not, he's not showing a reenactment of exactly what happened. He's showing critiques um, of sound in front of the law, the, the, the kind of messiness of it, the way in which it cannot be parsed in the same way as an image can. And therefore, it's always a sort of... Um, uh, uh, unfaithful evidence. It's always kind of half lying, right? Um, and and it's, it's lying because the ways in which the truth has been, the, the protocols of truth have been established do not accommodate the way it sort of moves and it, 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 it uh, activates space and the way it, it resounds, right? So, um, so that's what I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, that's the sort of, uh, the, the sort of medium uh, disconnect. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask one quick follow up to that, um, because just just sticking with with this kind of thought of, of evidence, because your work, you know, of course, your, your work does balance these these lines or moves between or bleeds between these lines between uh, between art and evidence. Uh, you know, the, the entire forensic architecture group works in those lines, but but your work in particular has been used in courtrooms, etc. So. Um, thinking about the evidentiary character of, of sound, I mean, the, the way you talk about is dirty evidence is really interesting to me. If you think about the history of sound, there are moments where, you know, to have the recordings of, of Nixon, that was enough to make it feel like he would, he could be impeached. So it had a legal character, even though, you know, those tapes never really had to, had to come into court. Um, at the very same, same time, we have artists manipulating tape, cutting up tape, et cetera, and showing that it's, you know, it's com mm -hmm. completely false or as false as you want it to be. Um, more recently, I'm thinking about a decade ago, Jonathan Stern wrote a piece called The Enemy Voice that was about voice printing, and in particular, the voice of Osama bin Laden and the tapes of Osama bin Laden, the ways in which people seem to be particularly, people in the US government, the media seem to be particularly afraid of allowing his voice to be heard with the same uh, sonic, uh, sonic affordances of the voice of a president in the United States, for instance. So. They played these voices with the tape hiss and uh, kind of far mm -hmm. off into the back, right? Rather than through uh, a microphone with the audio cleaned up, et cetera. Um, so it, ultimately in that argument, it seemed like he was saying voice printing. Um, I mean, there are many things he's saying in the argument, but one is that voice printing is really not possible. It's really just comparing media. And so I'm wondering with that in mind and thinking about the kind of forensic, uh, you know, photographic work that you presented at the end that's being used in a way to make this other history possible. What is the relationship that you see between that kind of, you know, imaginary forensics, I guess is what I would think to call it for the moment at least, um, not, not using imaginary in a, in a pejorative term, mm -hmm. it's not possible, but, um, and of course what, so many people are, are worried about these days, which are which are deep fakes and the possibility of, of, of creating images that carry veracity, that seem to carry truth um, while they're used for manipulation. So can you talk a little bit about how you'd see the relation between those two things? And then I'll turn to, to some of the questions we have here in the Q&A. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that the deep fake does not trouble the production of truth, right? It, it only works within of the 
sort of confines of what is already, or, or the ways in which we, we, we've chosen to produce truth, right? It respond directly to that, to that, to it as a medium in itself. And therefore, the, the, re, the difference between a kind of deep fake and let's say, other forms of progress listing and production of evidence, like an accent, right? I <laughs> used as a birth certificate, which is another kind of deep fake, right? Are, are always going to be somehow continuous, right? Um, but what I'm interested in is evidence, which is both presentable as evidence, or at least there's an attempt to present it as evidence, which also has a kernel within of it that can trouble the production of, of uh, truth, you know, that can trouble the, the foundations on which uh, the truth is produced and evidence is solicited, right? Um, and I think, for example, uh, that's, you know, like I tried to say before, that, that's why I think sound is so important because it's often, it's, it's, it's there, right? And the law could never face it for what it is because as soon as it does, it will have to ask itself questions about how its truths are made, right? So it will, will always try to keep sound as a poor image, right? It will never try to see what sound could actually say for itself, right? Um, and the kind of uh, what, that, what that relationality actually espouses, right? And some of that is, is because, let's say, it's also how the law produces impartiality, right? So if you commit a crime in the past, when you are presented before a law court in the US, they cannot automatically use that crime as a kind of judge of your character, right? So that crime cannot leak into the other, right? And, and I think many of us would agree that that's, uh, that's good, right? That these forms of impartiality exist. Yet that shows you a window into a logic in which all of, all of the evidence is produced, right? And forms of isolationism continue before. And that's why the law is, is so bad at dealing with any kind of structural change, right? Because um, it's always isolating, individualizing, right? Never can, can understand these things as a kind of um, uh, a structural violence um, or a, you know, structural violence is kind of a buffer to that. So, um, so what was I saying? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think that the difference between deepfake and let's say um, the, the unorthodox production of history that someone like Basel is producing is that what Basel is doing is not only producing a history, he's troubling the very foundation on which history is produced, right? Uh, through a kind of, um, through, uh, you know, a, a dogmatic pursuit of the production of history, right? It's never that, it's not a cynical idea, right? It's not cynical saying, you know, it's not a deconstructivist idea where we're saying there is no truth, right? Um, and then this all proves that there is there, no truth can ever exist. No, it's actually in the pursuit of truth, uh, of, but, but just in that pursuit allows for um, the dissolution of the ways in which we, or, or, or kind of re-encounter with the ways in which we have to um, think that. And, and that's very important in that case, because, you know, you could easily see a reading of that as kind of multicultural, right? That people would say, um, oh, look, isn't it interesting that there are other forms of truth practices going on, right? Um, and you can see a lot of academic work doing that, right? And what I would say is no. And this is why the, I, I also would never say that he believes in this, because I think belief has been a kind of way in which liberal discourse has allowed for radical uh, has allowed to in some way pacify uh, the radical production of uh, history right to say that okay they believe in this so we should listen to them right <laughs> but what i'm saying is there's there's no way that this history even exists without this right so so it's not that it's uh, it's not um it's not that it's um uh, uh another way it's the it's actually one of the only viable ways we can do mm -hmm. And so it needs, the new, a new category of witness needs to be produced um, for this to happen. So um, again, yeah, it, it, it's, trying to, it's trying to see where those lines can, where evidence can be presented, which breaks uh, through the, the, those logics in a way um, and yeah. still retain it somehow, its evidentiary power, uh, yeah.
Um, so no, sorry. To, I mean, that's it's incredible, and I love this idea of a, of a new the necessity for a new type of witness to be to be produced. Um, I, I want to get to some of the other other questions. I mean, I could talk to you for hours. Uh, one one is just a, a, a statement which uh, from Catherine Hamilton who says no no question. Just want to say this is one of the most incredible talks I've I've seen this year. Thank you, BCNM, and thank you, Lawrence. Um, a oh. question from <laughs> thank you. It was yeah. Sure. What is your relationship sharing your work on YouTube? Do you approach it as a Creative Commons public domain? I mean, I have almost nothing interesting to say about that, uh, only that uh, it's just like I consume a lot of YouTube. I'm never on Vimeo. I get sent Vimeo links all the time. I consume a lot of YouTube, so I thought, well, I should put it on YouTube. Also, I think it can have a more unexpected life on YouTube. Um, and I just put everything up at the beginning of the pandemic. So it's not been consistent with my whole uh, approach, but at the beginning of the pandemic, everything shut down. I thought, okay, well, you know, because I guess things are off offline to, you know, to, to also help support museums and, and people who want to share the work. But if uh, those are closed, then, you know, they can, they can be online. Um, but then what's nice is that UberWeb picked them up uh, and actually they, uh, so w without me sending them to Ubu or whatever, they're now on Ubu and I might take them down one day from YouTube, but they will forever exist on Ubu web, which is great because that was a very important and still is. Uh, do you have another example explanation of sonic image outside this produced sonic image of the boy soldier still trying to get hold of this important differentiation? Uh, also, what might this do to race gender differentiations or how does race or gender enter into the sonic image, into how the sonic image becomes? Um, so, uh, another example, <laughs> no, I'm joking, because, you know, what I tried to do with the talk is have it, you know, it would be, it would be, it would have been a flaw to do a talk on the sonic image, which was incredibly direct, which had no bleed, right? And I felt that, okay, if I'm gonna do a talk about things that leak, this talk itself needs to start leaking, hemorrhaging in its own way, and in that way, produce its own um, kind of set of collectivities, right? Like uh, in the way in which I sort of described the cricket bat and the gun suddenly become conjoined. There needed to be this work. So that's why I'm sort of moving through these these worlds. Um, uh, can I, can um, I ask you maybe, so just thinking of um, your work on, uh, you know, the Syrian prisons, for example. Yeah. Is, is that in some ways a different notion of the, of the sonic, um, of the sonic image? In yeah, part? sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I think maybe that question was written before I sort of made this idea of dirty I added this another concept of dirty evidence right that um but i would just like to respond that this question of race or gender i mean yeah. it, it's it, it's exactly uh what the voice analysis work on right and in many ways without going into the the specifics of it what sort of certain kind of um disc forms of discrimination uh uh, uh in the uh, so in these uh, exams actually try to uh, break through those lines, those uh, those hard borders. That's the point of these examples. That's the point for me, at least, in in thinking sonically and having a sonic imagination. So if you if you remember that there was this institution of the of the borders uh, of Somalia, uh, this this is entirely racist, right? The, all the voice accent stuff is entirely racist. So um, so that's really how I think. Um, discriminatory forms or forms of uh, identitarianism uh, are actually troubled by this, uh, this way of having a sonic imagination and producing sonic images um, in the way that I've showed in the Somalia case, in the way that I showed with Bassett, right? Um, they, they all negate ideologies of monolingualism, colonialism, uh, state-sanctioned uh, 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 discrimination and uh, uh, f forms of individualism. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say there. And sorry, Tom, what, what, what did you ask? Well, uh, I mean, yeah. I was just wondering about how the, how the work that you've done with the Syrian prisons right, is a right. masonic image. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, um, I think, 
how there's plenty of example i mean that was really uh, i mean for me very important and, and, and you you picked up on this uh very importantly tom in the talk that that it's never about sound right and i think this this the stupidest thing that i could do um in a talk where i'm trying to speak about how sound uh, destroy certain kinds of boundaries and 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 sort of bounded modes of thinking would be to sort of re-essentialize sound right uh, and and re and and make it a kind of uh, its own disciplinary space and borders around it right and so important for me in Nuremberg that's why thinking uh, you know that's why um, you know I, I actually called that uh, those maps a sound piece right uh, the, the the maps of Somalia sign seekers, even though it's silent, even though it's visual. So, I think um, uh, you know that that of course was confirmed to me when I was working on the Said Naya case because we, you know, coming back to this idea of sort of not being able really to parse between certain kinds of um, uh, sensory modes right and some of the most lucid evidence in that case came from bleed uh, bleed outside of sound so i went in thinking okay i'm just doing a sound investigation i'm going to work on what they heard in that prison um, for amnesty but uh, in fact when we start speak about sound you started to immediately think about be able to hear hunger or start to listen to hunger and the way hunger distorted certain kinds of audibility um uh you start to you know hear si silence become a kind of heterogeneous space right uh, um things were remembered as uh, with colors and and then when you ask if they'd been seen they would say no right spaces that had only ever been heard uh color entered right so it was the idea that then it, that I should only be working on sound uh, was 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 uh, quickly sort of it made me seem very you know ignorant and naive in that time because I really had to quickly work to understand how rich these interrelations and these bleeds were actually happening and so that was really yeah like a sort of lesson in um, in this. Uh, in the necessity for the production of dirty evidence and the argument for dirty evidence that uh, that in its the kind of unclean and it's an impossibility to sort of clean off the subject to parse what is um what is what the biases are and what uh what 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 this the the state of perception are right say if we could just hear a sound in that place it would get us nowhere to understanding let's say how what it means to hear that sound hungry right and to hear that sound hungry is an artifact of the violence right but it's a it's an artifact that we could never present in a court of law right because it just there's just no forum to accept it um so i, I know I'm, I'm kind of rambling but it, 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 i hope it sort of makes some sense that there is a necessity to sort of keep that um and to to, uh, to find uh capacities to um present and those forms of evidence that would otherwise be inadmissible um uh, yeah, no, I think that's a powerful way to think about it and to think about the sensuousness of sound and to think about the multiple aspects of both one's own body and what one hears as part of the evidence of sound, that the evidence of sound is not always submissive or, or you know, applicable to a, to a legal ear, but it still is carrying a lot of information that might not fit into, into a legal framework. Um, and that sounds are images and images are sounds and that there's a active flow between the two. I hope that was also clear in the, in the work. Well, and yeah, yeah, that's, that's absolutely clear. And so one thing about that, um, and, and we've only got about five more minutes left again, if anyone has further questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the, in the Q and A. But, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the design of those, uh, of the, of the maps of the Somali accents and how they really, because I can't help look at those and recognize how beautiful they are. They're incredibly just brilliantly designed. And it's not only about uh, information. I'm sure that, you know, that we can talk about how design itself is about, uh, you know, an attractive way to understand information. But it, could you say a little bit more about just the artistic quality of, of those? And also, 
about the relationship. Um, I asked this a little bit earlier, but again, this, this kind of bleed between art and evidence and how important it is in an evidentiary framework to have something that captures someone's, you know, I don't, it doesn't have to be aesthetic eye, but, mm. cap, you know, but there's, there's some kind of pull that's happening with the particular design of those maps. It's not just um, a data stream, but it's yeah. a specific organization. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's almost banal to say, right? But that each mode of truth production is itself an aesthetic, uh, an aesthetic practice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, look at the law court, right? It's also, yeah, it's also a kind of a, you know, it, it, perhaps beauty is not the best way to describe it, but you know. Let's say the, the the costume, the robes, the architecture, right? These are all um, extremely considered design choices, <laughs> or aesthetic practices, we could say, right? Um, and I think we've often decided uh, to give the monopoly of the discussion of politics to a specific kind of aesthetic practice, right? Um, uh, where whether it's the, the way the news edits footage or the law discusses uh, uh, it in a trial, right? Or, uh, you know, so I think, um, uh, I think it comes back to this idea also of a pursuit of an, an active pursuit of a kind of truth making, uh, even if that is troubling uh, the production of truth that, um, that currently exists, right? Or, or that is currently active agent in the production of a, a subjectivity um, so uh, so then if it's if it's a sincere desire um, to to make truth claims and sometimes difficult truth claims then it has to also be a, a, a kind of um, aesthetic practice it has to be aesthetized to and and aesthetize people to ways of seeing and and, and sensing the world um, that allow for those politics to emerge. Um, uh, and, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. And I guess just the, the, the other side of that, I was, I was teaching a, a class a couple of semesters ago and we were looking at some of the work from um, Paulo Tavares uh, and right, kind of thinking about photography. He's working with photography and forensic architecture and yeah. through genocide cases. And, um, you know, part of the discomfort of that conversation was thinking on the one hand that there's a real importance here in the ways you're describing that aesthetics is sensitizing people to specific information in order to make it legible to to bring this uh, case to court but not only to make it legible i mean yeah it's it's also it's i think it's more than just making it legible i think it's about aesthetizing people to it's sort of like making people sensitive, right? It's not, you see what I mean? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the, but the, I, and I, I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly, but then the, when that work goes from the courtroom into the, the Tate Modern, let's say. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's something, you know, just the institutional, in, institutional space changes the meaning of what you're looking at in some ways. And I think for, you know, for, for some of the, the students in my class, it was, it, it felt like to, you know, fall into this old story about kind of the aestheticization of violence, which mm -hmm. of course, that's not what the work is, is doing, but the institution in some ways um, alters or frames at least the object that you're looking at. Yeah. So could you just yeah. say a little bit? Yeah, about but I mean, I would just go to, to yeah, yeah, sure. No, it's a great question. And I think there are those problems for sure. And we shouldn't run from them. I think you're, you're entirely right to raise it. But what I would go back to saying is that that assumes that other platforms do not aesthetize violence, right? That the law is not already an aesthetization of violence, right? But in its own terms, that the news does not uh, uh, totally aesthetize violence. Uh, and, and so all I'm saying is that the aesthetization of violence is a kind of zone of contention, right? We can either choose to be aesthetized to that violence through the means which the law and the news and the media uh, allow us to be aesthetized to it, or we can actually try to invent, or not invent, it sounds very arrogant, but like 
create new conditions of uh, seeing those things. And yeah, when it enters different institutions, each one of those has their own problems, right? But we should be careful not to say that, oh, the law is the proper space for this to happen, and the gallery is aesthetizing, right? The gallery is somehow on the side, because that is a really big misunderstanding of what the and how the law operates and 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 how it works right and it's and and so what i say is that actually each medium like say art science law each have its own way of producing truth right uh, they all have entire they're all entirely prob full full of problems right ethical problems everything like that but um but yeah, and it's not that one is essentially better than the other, but it's, in, it's, it's, it's useful to learn from the different means of truth production that exists within of each one uh, and to understand how, um, you know, yeah. So, so I would just say that, I mean, I think it's, it's a little bit, that argument for me always feels a bit protective of galleries in a way, right? I think it thinks it's criticizing them, but actually it's sort of protecting them uh, and, and sort of essentializing them and making them very, um, trying to keep them clean, right? Or trying to say that they're sort of space outside. Um, uh, and I, I just don't, yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, again, like I said, I could speak with you for hours. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our, our time here, but I want to thank you so much on behalf of BCNM and thanks to the audience for, for coming tonight and for your questions. And also thanks again to Denise for, for captioning, to Sophia and Lara for all of their, uh, all of their infrastructural work and support in, in making this happen tonight. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you very much, everybody. Sophia and Lara also, thank you so much.